you know, um, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, I work for BC Hydro, which is an energy utility in British Columbia, Canada. The one thing that's, I think, uh, <clears throat> a profoundly interesting thing about the industry that I'm in is very rarely do people actually think about our product until it's not there. And right now, as I look around this room, I see people that are sort of on their laptops, on their iPhones, watching a screen, enjoying the lights. And if all of a sudden all the electricity in this room went off, including all the batteries, everyone would be in this sort of profound state of shock. And going with the analogy yesterday where someone said that, uh, you know, Generation Y folks would rather kind of clean a toilet than, uh, than actually do some work with like sort of self-service or call an agent. Um, I've heard also from a peer of mine that the energy utility is often considered like toilet paper. It's that you don't think about it when it's there, but as soon as it's gone, it is the th only thing you can think about at that time. <laughs> so that's some color to kind of help frame my industry for you. <clears throat> but also, I mean, when you really think about it, what a great time to be alive. And as I looked around this room earlier, and I've been sitting at the back for the last day and a bit, um, there's people here multitasking right now. And there's people on their laptops, they're on their iPhones, and that's great because this is the kind of benefit that technology gives us, is the ability to be in multiple places at once and do things and extend ourselves in ways that we've never been able to in the past. And so as we go through this presentation, <clears throat> sorry, this clicky thing does not seem to be working. Hang on a sec. Let's just tap that. Hmm. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so when we think about it, really, times have sure changed. And they've changed in profound ways. And I know that everyone in this room probably knows this already. And when you think about technology, just over the last you know, 10 years, we've gone from a desktop culture, which was largely unconnected, to a mobile culture where we're connected all the time. And you have systems today that are you know, four times as powerful, five times or 20 times the memory, double the storage, half the price, and chances are that every single person in this room has one within arm's reach nearly 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In fact, if you left your house without your wallet, or if you left your house without your cell phone, which one would be more concerning to you? Think about that. <clears throat> 20 years ago, People would be like, if I left my wallet, I'm going home. Nowadays, if you leave, leave your wallet, you might be like, I could still do what I need to do and just keep going. However, it's really not just about the technology, because I mean, that's fun and fascinating and all, but technology really is just a tool. It's how it's changed our lives, it's really profound. And when you think about in the past, how we got around, we'd pull out the big paper map on road trips and they'd be out there, and then all of a sudden, that got replaced by GPS in the car, which really quickly got replaced by your phone, because it's with you all the time. And in some cases, I could even say that in the last few days here, I've been getting around by my watch. And for any of you that have an Apple Watch, I never thought the navigation would be that good, but the fact it taps you differently to turn left or right means I don't even have to look at my screen, I just go, and then as I get tapped, I'm like, oh, turn, keep going, and eventually I end up where I'm supposed to be. When you look at how we listen to music, how we capture the moment, these are things that are almost exclusively done on your phones. Whereas previously, you used to carry a lot of these devices around. And I used to work for a telecommunications company before I went into the energy business. And I remember first going out to retailers across the country and saying, hey, we have these camera phones. They're pretty amazing. Here's what you can do with it. And got laughed out the door more often than not. Because people said, no one's going to take a picture of something on a shelf and send it back to home and say, hey, is this what you're thinking of? They're like, no one's ever going to do that. When I look around this room, do people do that? All the time. When you think about how we connect as a family, remember uh, on the holidays you'd pick up the phone and do a long distance call to grandma or grandpa if you live in a different state or province and you'd have that conversation. And now you just pop it up every kind of few days and my daughter who's two years old and my uh, mother who lives halfway across the country uh, see each other every week. And they connect at that human level through technology. <clears throat> So many aspects of our lives. When you think about books, uh, mail, rental movies, these are all things that really have gone almost exclusively electronic and have made things so much easier for people and how they entertain themselves and how they function on a daily basis. The en energy industry is actually no exception. And um, if you would have asked the same question five, 10 years ago, we probably would not have been the exception. In the sense that our grid has been the same for nearly 100 years. And if you took Thomas Edison from his day, pulled him out and dropped him into the you know, year 2000 and said, take a look at this grid, he'd be able to recognize everything front to back, from generation right down to the home and even the meter. It was all the same technology. And only in the last about decade have we started switching over to you know, smart meters and smart technologies and smart grids that have really profoundly changed how the energy industry works. 
It's given us more data that's accessible in near real time that can go out in different ways and be used in different ways. And this for us marked a profound change. But I think the most important profound change is that our customers have changed. And for any one of you in this room, if you work in an industry that has customers, which I'd argue that, in fact, everyone does, that's how we work as business, you'll see this fundamental shift in how they operate today that's differently than how they operated five or 10 years ago. And let's talk a little bit more about this. So when we think about how customers have changed, if I were to ask the question, so what does a modern customer expect? What are some of the things that first come to mind? Any brave soul feel like shooting out something? Instant responses, so things that are fast, convenient. What else? Intuitive. Intuitive, yep. People expect that, hey, you know how people work, right, if you're building something, so therefore you should work for me. What else? Know who they are. Know who they are, so being smart. Yeah, absolutely. And if I were to summarize these kind of very really simple, customers really expect you to be easy to do business with, which touches on that intuitive piece and touches on the fact that it's fast. I mean, let's face it. People have been doing customer service for a really long time. People have been doing customer service in the technology landscape for a really long time. Customers' expectations are set quite high on these things. They also expect you to be respectful and honest. <clears throat> Part of being respectful is treating you know, their data, their privacy, things like that. Being honest, being upfront. They certainly expect it to be safe. And I mean, if you have a product or something like in the energy industry, we deal with electricity. Our product, if you touch it, it'll hurt you. If you taste it, it'll kill you. And so people expect everything to be safe. And they also expect you to be smart but not creepy. And I think this is an important one because in the context of what we're talking about here today, um, we can be smart, but we can also get creepy really quick with the access to the information that we have. And earlier, just actually, I think the session right prior, they were talking about, you know, there's certain things that kind of companies need to keep guarded. And the one benefit about being an energy utility that's very jurisdictionally bound is that I can come up here and sort of just you know, open the kimono, as it were, and say, here's exactly what we do, and you can ask any question you like, and I'm gonna answer all of them. Because none of you are my competition. And within the energy industry, this is how we work with one another, because if I work in an area and you work in a different area, our areas are regulated and will never mix. Therefore, let's just share. And so as we go through the rest of this presentation, if you guys do have any questions or you wanna go deeper on a particular topic, please just interrupt me and I'll answer them in real time. So if we ask the question again, so what do customers really want? Sadly, the answer is it's complicated. <clears throat> and it's complicated for a lot of reasons because if Henry Ford asked their customers at the time, what do you want? What they would have said is I want stronger, faster horses with more endurance, right? But what they got was a car. So what happened is right at the gate, they actually transformed how people think because people weren't able to stretch their imagination out to the product that was being offered at the time. Same thing, Apple back in the day. If Apple went to its customers, which in fact they did, and did a lot of research about what are you looking for in terms of phones? Anyone know what customers said at the time? Take a guess. All right. They said they wanted smaller flip phones with longer battery life. Remember the good old days where you had the Motorola flip phone and everyone just wanted that one that was slightly smaller, slightly thinner? Longer battery was you know, good for a week. Nowadays, do you care if your phone's good for a week? No, you just want it to be fast, you want it to be functional, you want it to be great, and if you have to charge it every night, so be it. What they got was the iPhone. And so it's interesting, when you think about what customers want and innovation, there's a bit of a negative correlation between the two <clears throat> at first. And when you think about the industry that we're talking about here, we're talking about intelligent assistance, we're talking about cutting edge innovation. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever showed your product or showed a product like this or, or been shown a product like this and thought for a second that that doesn't feel right? Show of hands. Anyone? Right. Because what you're dealing with is the most innovative stuff that's out there. If I said that, hey, this billboard can actually see my emotion, some people would be like, I don't know how I feel about that. I think that was the discussion we just had. If someone's recording what I'm saying over an IVR and then processing that and being able to actually offer up things it knows about me because it's starting to make pairings of information, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And I think that if I were to kind of overlay my personal views on it, I think it's a great thing because I really like it when machines make my life easier. And I really like it when there's things being offered to me or things being suggested to me that actually make sense. And what I don't like is the white noise around the edges. So when you think about though, initial acceptance of things by and large, and innovation, they have an inverse correlation to one another. And the key thing is, is even though you might have the best innovation out there, you might get resisted at first. 
because it really just has to work. And it's when it works 90%, not 100%, that that 10% is irksome to people. And that can be actually the 10% that actually stops the innovation from taking hold. So since we'd still need to innovate, because that's what modern business is like, some of the kind of true norths that you can start thinking of while you're trying to innovate out there, one is that the solutions simply need to work. We've said that, I've said that a couple times now. And they have to be pretty darn close to 100%. And so resisting the urge to put something out there that's not quite ready is important because once you go out there and if it doesn't work properly, trying to come back from that's tough. Make it easy to do business with the companies you are. And so if you're actually a company that is in the market of you know, virtual assistants, make it easy for your customers, but make it easy for their customers. And I'm gonna to be touching in about sort of that customer centricity and about why making it easy is so important shortly. Use a customer-centric design. You know, yesterday the keynote Geraldine was talking about put the customer right at the center of what you do. And I can't echo that enough in the sense that we're all here because of our customers and any business's long-term success is directly related to how their customers perceive and feel about them. The industry I'm in, we're a monopoly. Customers don't even have a choice. But yet, the customer's at the center of our business because customers without choice, if you treat them poorly, hate you. And that resentment is strong when they have no choice. But if customers have no choice and you treat them in a wonderful way and they really appreciate you, there's pride in that. And so it's interesting to see how that customer-centric design, no matter what your business model is, always makes sense. Meet customers where they're at. And so customers, if they're coming at you through social channels, you should be in your social channels. If customers are coming at you on mobile, you should be in mobile. Same thing with desktop, same thing on the phone. Whatever your customer chooses is their preferred channel of choice. That is the opportunity for you to excel. And for some people, that's tough to hear because a lot of people have been in the sort of the job killing mode where it says, oh, virtual agent replaces human agents. There's cost savings there. And in fact, there is. And a lot of customers will be fine with that, but some won't. And if you force them all into one versus another, you end up actually finding it, um, you're going to start losing customers on the edges. And that's difficult because there's going to be a lot of your competitors out there that will be really willing to pick those up. And who here has seen any kind of commercials or advertising lately where some companies come out saying like, live human, first time you call every time. There's people that have gone out there and said, that's our thing, because what they're appealing to is all the people that don't like the alternative. So know that by not offering it, you're going to lose some people. The key is about, though, making it easy, because again, if I can do what I need to do on your website, much easier than it takes for me to pick up the phone and call you, that's how I'm going to do it. But as soon as it becomes even slightly more difficult, and my mind switches to, ugh, this is terrible, I just want to call, then I'm going to do that not only that time, but from that time thereafter. And so it's interesting how human behavior works. We're always looking for path of least resistance. It's also important for us to be proactive versus reactive. You know, often in most service industries, there's an opportunity that you're going to have where you could actually solve a problem before your customer even knew there was a problem. But that puts more work on your side. Things like predictive analytics, things like understanding how to get those messages out there and how to resolve them. And also having the courage to say to a customer, by the way, there's a problem, and not sit back hoping that, I hope they don't notice that even though we've corrected that. And so it's about that authentic interaction. Also, make service intuitive. And I know this came up as well at the back there, is that that intuition of how you do things and that sort of uh, strong user experience is critical for all these solutions. Because if people are going to struggle to learn what you have, or if you think, oh, they'll just learn that, reality is they might, but they're going to work harder. And the harder they work, the more they're going to churn channels. All of these need to be balanced, of course, with keeping costs low. And so trying to figure out what the right mix of solutions are that actually help you shed cost while being effective in a business is actually a delicate balancing act that a lot of companies, I think, struggle with at a time. But eventually, if you do it long enough and you think about it in certain ways, you'll hit that sweet spot in the middle where you'll find that you can keep costs low and be innovative and do the right thing. It just takes some work and some strategy. So if we take a look at what service looks like at BC Hydro, Really, we're an omni-channel uh, organization. So we have digital, social, uh, mobile. We use email. We use intelligent assistance, which I'll talk about more so in a moment. We have all of our in-person service, so at our main offices, um, we're in the community. And of course, call centers, IVR systems. So pretty much the full gambit of how you might want to touch base with a customer, with the exception of things like online chat, which we haven't gotten to yet. And so we're a lot of things to a lot of people in a lot of different ways. But again, we're a crown corporation or a public company um, in British Columbia, Canada. And so customers don't have a choice. So that way, we'd kind of have to have that range. 
to make sure that we're catering to everyone from you know, the most technology inept grandmother to the most technology savvy 18 year old that's out there. We also focus on integration, and I think this is an important part because you can have online service, in-person service, phone service, and you can integrate it in a seamless way so the experience is pretty ubiquitous across all. Also, for a lot of the companies you work with, um, organizations sometimes can get siloed. And when you think about what it looks like to be siloed, where you might have a marketing group that's here, you have a customer service group that's there, and you have a, another group that's over here, and they're all doing slightly different things. If they start to kind of each kind of get out the gate in their own way, that creates a very confusing landscape for customers. So what I'm gonna show you here in just a moment is a video that we used uh, to help promote our web self-service portal and our overall online tools to customers um, as part of an acquisition campaign to get customers to put down the phone and go online. What I encourage you to look at when I show you this for a moment is, does this all make sense from like a customer perspective? And is it a seamless story? So take a moment and watch this and I'll come back to it in just one moment. Your online BC Hydro account, now called My Hydro, has a new look and feel. Save time by managing your account online. Plus, discover ways to save energy and money by viewing and tracking your electricity consumption right down to the hour. Examining your hourly usage gives you the right information at the right time, helping you identify exactly where you can save. Use tools to compare your electricity use to last year, homes nearby, and even average daily <coughs> temperature. You'll also be able to view projected costs for your next bill based on your current electricity consumption. If you're heading for higher than expected costs, check out our PowerSmart tips to see how you could save. Knowing how and when you're using your electricity allows you to make changes to save energy and money. Put our PowerSmart tips into action and watch your energy costs decrease. Maximize your savings by joining Team PowerSmart, where you'll find exclusive coupons, tips, and contests. If you've had a BC Hydro account at your current address for at least a year, start a $75 challenge. Cut your electricity use by 10% or more over the next 12 months, and you could get a $75 reward. Managing your account is easier too. Go paperless, view your bill and payment history, or set up a pre-authorized or equal <coughs> payment plan. Plus, you can start, stop, or move your service, all conveniently online. So start saving. Your My Hydro profile is just a few clicks away. Create yours now. All right. So by show of hands, who felt that that felt like a relatively seamless, seamless value proposition? A couple of you. Thank you. What you saw there was actually about nine internal business units in BC Hydro working together to create one value proposition for customers and an attempt to again drive them online. And when you think about the transformation that we've went through, we've gone through a lot of change within the digital space over the years. We've now gotten to a place though where the vast majority of our tra transactions are online and there's no price signal in place to do that. It's not like we charge less for online service than we charge for the phone. And there's no policies in place where you have to go online. This is purely voluntary. If you were looking to look at our journey, I mean, in 2002, you can kind of pause for a moment and take this website in. Like, that's what they looked like, right? And at the time, we thought that was great. You move forward to 2004. This was the age of the content explosion where we had thousands of web pages. Everyone internally thought like, oh, my group needs a, a page and we got to put some content out there and it's going to be very complicated and very kind of engineering-like. Uh, and we, I think we hit seven or 8,000 pages on our website for utility, which is crazy by today's standards. 2008, we started introducing our web portal and self-service, and so that was our first toe dip into sort of that technology automation of things. And the cutting principle at the time was, if it's a really easy transaction, and they can do that in the call center in really no effort, and there's no value add that the agent is getting, can we just automate it fully and have them do it online 100%? And so we started focusing on that. 2010, we introduced our first mobile site. We also started working a bit more on sort of that content reduction, and we got it down to about 30% to what it was. 2010, started bringing in more user experience. We added social media channels to our digital offerings, and we started focusing a bit more on the brand piece. You fast forward to today, and what we have now is a minimalistic, customer-centered design. 
when you look at this, when you land on our page, first you have the big kind of you know, tablet-friendly buttons, and it's all about the customer. It's what do you need to do? Why are you coming here? Of course, that carousel with kind of news and messages is there for important things that we need to communicate, because we often have that requirement. But the rest is purely transactional. And it's important because when you think about a utility, who here has ever in their life woke up one day and thought, I need something fun to do today. I'm going to call my power company. <laughs> right? We got one person. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but the reality is, is people don't. Right? What they think about is they just want to live their lives. And the only time they're calling us is when they need to pay a bill or the power's out or they want to set up something or something got confusing or they need help. And so there's always a need that drives it which is the sad part about our industry is that if they're ignoring you fully and not thinking about you at all, that's kind of pretty good. But if they need to contact you, it's gonna be generally something that's not so good, so the best you can hope for is neutral. And occasionally with energy efficiency, you can kind of tip it to the positive side. But most interactions actually drive down your satisfaction. And so inside our web portal, we tried to make it easy for customers to do things, and what you'll see in here is a few kind of key um, Area. So one is, of course, balance, because we're very transactional by industry. It's a commodity. People just want to buy power. We have consumption. We have account management tools for essentially every function you can do for the vast majority of them. And then you also have other areas where you can manage your account and get some help, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the top right corner, there's also that ask a question. And I'm going to come back to that just in a moment. But overall, this web portal, as it were, and the same thing is on mobile, um, allows customers to do pretty much everything you need to do with the utility, with the exception of some more complicated things. Like if you needed to, say, negotiate uh, payment terms on a very late bill. Like that's something that our people need to work with you on. It's very uh, human in terms of what you can do with a machine where it just breaks it up. But that's kind of what our journey looks like. And when you kind of take our journey out of the equation for a second and think about what a typical customer journey looks like, this is what they all are, more or less soup to nuts. Something prompts a need for service, right? Because again, people don't wake up one day and think, I'm gonna go get some service today, right? There's something that prompted it. Whether that be a high bill, an outage, an invoice inquiry, something was confusing, there's a power line down. No matter what industry you're in, think about why people you're coming to in the first place. Something provoked them to do that. So that's an important thing to understand. Once they've decided that I need to get a hold of you, most people don't know your phone number off the top of their you know, head. So what they'll do is they have to try to find a way to get a hold of you. So most people will go to Google or go to your website or maybe grab a bill or something. So they're going to initiate with you in some way. They're then going to check, uh, choose a channel that they want to visit. And so that could be web, could be chat, could be email, could be uh, calling, could be any of those things. And they're going to get resolution one way or the other, good, bad, or ugly. So I mean, that's kind of in broad strokes, call it the typical building blocks of any customer journey. Some key insights to know about this is that People would rather be doing almost anything else than getting customer service. So know that going into it. It's not always going to be pleasant. And the more difficult you make getting customer service, the more they're going to not like that. So making it easy is critical. Almost all of your service interactions start online, even your phone calls. And so if you can contain people online and make it easier for them to be there, it ends up being much better in terms of call reductions, et cetera. Different channels carry different costs. Call centers, quite expensive, because you're paying a person to now talk to someone. And if you're, you know, even if you outsource and go overseas and things like that, there's still a higher cost there than a high output scalable digital channel. Also, unresolved issues come back to haunt you. They'll end up costing you more in the future, because if they try online and try to use your web infrastructure and they fail, then they get frustrated and they call, they're going to tell your agent how frustrated they are, that drives out your average handle time. And there's going to be a lot more involved in trying to actually make that good. Your opportunity for churn goes up, losing that customer, things like that. So trying to make sure to solve service issues the first time is, I think, pretty common sense. So if you look at our contact strategy, and this is where we start bringing in that intelligent assistance, is we know that when people start to struggle online, what do they look for? Contact us, right? And some companies have decided to take the... Uh, the obtrusive or sort of obstructive way of doing it, being like, we're just not going to publish a phone number, which means if you want to get hold of us, <laughs> you can't. Suffer online, which makes people feel wonderful usually. Um, we don't. And so what we've tried to do is try the overtly helpful way of solving this problem. So when you click Contact Us, you end up on a page that looks like this. Right out the gate, and it's going to be hard to see because it's a bit off the screen, um, the Ask a Question is at the top there again. So that's a persistent piece of our banner where at any moment, customers can type in whatever question they want using natural language, and they will get an answer of some form. On the Contact Us page, we overtly call that out. We say, hey, 
If you ask a question, put it in online, and we can help. If customers are also not in the mood for typing, which again, trying to make things easy, sometimes people will be like, no, I just want your number, and they're kind of on that. They're also going to cruise by our common questions, which means they might even see the question they want to answer, and then now we're talking one click as opposed to even some keystrokes. Just got a little easier, right? And as you scroll down at the very bottom, there is, of course, the call us, and here's our phone number. But what you see is we're not being obstructive. Our call information is clearly on our Contact Us page. It's just below all of the other things we're going to put there to be helpful in front of it. As we look at this solution, this is where intelligent assistance comes in. It's not about a QA. It's not about um, kind of being obstructive and getting no calls coming in. What it's trying to do is saying to a customer, you're already online. Let me help you there. And if I have an answer for you and that's going to solve your problem, let's just do it quick and easy. And so when we think about our intelligent assistance journey, it has created significant savings for our organization. And so let's just take the customer you know, temporarily out of the equation. From a business view, we've been able to automate a lot of those typical questions that come in, which have deflected calls in a large way. So the business case is really positive. It's also enabled us, though, to communicate in different ways with customers. And this is, I think, the important part, is that it wasn't just solving a monetary challenge. It also is enhancing our service. And so I'm going to dive a little bit more into what our actual intelligent assistance um, solution looks like. It's powered by IntelliResponse by 24-7. So that's one of the vendors in the room here that has a booth outside. So if you're interested in seeing more about their setup, I mean, feel free to actually talk to them. The thing about IntelliResponse that really worked for us, though, is that it was how we use it that really was interesting. It's an integrated way with how we have our customers search for content. And our deployment of IntelliResponse is not the, the full potential of the solution, but it was the one that integrated seamlessly with how we operate. So we said, here's our header. We have that ask a question. Note that it doesn't say search. Most com uh, companies out there have that site search, where they type in something and you get your search results, right? Which is really those words you typed in. Here are the pages they show up on. And that's how we're all used to kind of operating. But that's not helpful. Because if I were to say to you know, any of you, what, what's the right thing to type in to get the page you want? Is the word you're going to use and the word that I'm thinking you're going to use the same word? And I can research that. But even if it is, if I asked 100 people what's the word you're going to use, I'm going to get 50 answers. And so site search is limited. So intelligence is important. The other thing is when you click on it, there was really two key elements. And then there was the actual IntelliResponse answer, which is important. But then there was also the federated site search, because sometimes we may not be able to answer your question. But what you did type in is somewhere on our site. So we federated them together. And what it looks like is something like this. So if I typed in, what is your phone number as a question, that's the answer that would come up. It didn't say, our phone number is, because we also want to try to find to be as helpful as possible. So we say, what's your phone number? Well, here it is. Here's our address. Rate, is this helpful? Because obviously, quality is important on these things, and we want to continuously improve. Other related questions, uh, it's hard to see on the screen, but off to the side, there's some of the frequently asked questions, and that actually dynamically change, which I'll touch about momentarily. Also see, these are things that we think is important for customers to see when they're asking that question. And then below is the typical site search, which is powered for us by our typical Google, uh, Google bot. So all in, top five questions helps answer some things we know. Also see things like site index, others, just navigation help. But in total, it makes that up that contact us front line. And so what we say is when you come in, you can search anywhere across the whole site. You can ask a question anywhere across the whole site. You get to contact us. It overtly puts it out there to ask a question, followed by those common questions. So we're trying to encourage the ability for a customer to type in whatever they like. The other nice thing about the solution is it's that natural language query. We've decided in our deployment here to obviously go with text, but in a lot of instances, people might go for voice recognition. And so they can just ask it, whether it be on a mobile device, through a microphone on a desktop, et cetera. The point is, is that customers are coming with something in mind. You need to get that out of their mind and start working it through your system. If I said to any of you, you know, hey, here's a question about something I need to answer, as soon as I ask the question, you get it. You understand what that is, and you're going to start formulating a response. That's what the solution does. It just does it in sub-second timing, online, at whatever volume we can throw at it. The beautiful thing also about the energy industry is when things go wrong, they go wrong often at a large scale. Just three weeks ago, BC Hydro had a power outage that affected a million customers. Just for kind of background, we have 4 million customers, and we do about $4.3 billion worth of business annually. 
So that was a quarter of our customer base that all went out. Every single one of them, by and large, wanted to know when's my power going to be back on. How many agents do you need to handle a million calls in an hour? Think about it. You need like a million of them, which is never going to be practical. So what happens? Long hold times. What does that do for customer experience? Terrible. And if you put web tools up there, it gets easier because it's scalable. You can do a lot more. If you ask a question, when's my power going to be back on, you can get an answer. So when you think about that scalability to a volatile business like energy, critically important. The other thing that uh, is interesting when you look at sort of this contact us piece is the information that flows back. And I think one of the things that I've personally appreciated most about our virtual assistant solution is that it gives me insight on my customers that I didn't have before. Because I can look at a Google search or look at my site search and say, well, these are the words customers were hitting the most. But it doesn't give me that quality of understanding that I really require to affect my business. So I get this smart source report every month. And what it shows, and this is just a snippet of it, and there's a list of them along the bottom. If anyone wants to actually see ours, let me know and I'll email it to you. But it shows you like how many questions were answered, what times, what was the quality of them, what were people thinking about it. It's so far to say that, hey, here's a question people asked that weren't getting the right answer. You should probably think about writing content for this. So it's helping me mature all of my customer understanding, but also helping me mature my content that makes future interactions that much better. The other thing interesting that I think is important to note is the volume that hits my virtual assistant solution matches the volume that hits my call centers and other contact channels. So what it's helping me do is it's shaving off my peak, it's allowing me to manage my business better, it's reducing hold time for the rest of my customers, and it's getting the right information to the right consumer at the right time. So it's pretty powerful, all while giving me insights on what my customers are thinking and feeling and what they need to know about. They distill that down even further in a report that looks something like this, that actually says, here are the themes that are coming forward. You know, more people are asking about moving your account right now. It's the primary question. It's summer. It's moving season. It's just so you know. Power outages, that's coming down. So not as many people are asking about that. And that's fine, because those are things you might expect. But things like forest fires, uh, furnace rebates, these are all themes of content that are coming forward that if I had no idea, I might be writing content to go out through marketing channels or through newsletters or put information on our bill about, for example, um, forest fire season, when I can see that that content and that interest is trending down really fast. So why would I? When I might decide to replace it with something like setting up pre-authorized payment or the new rate increases that are happening. So it gives you the ability to formulate a content strategy in a different way with actual customer insights versus in the past, we'd be doing it from somewhat to intuition. We might be paying for research or we might be trying to scour our web data to look for trends on page hits and things, which may not be indicative of what customers are actually asking. What are they asking about? How are we addressing these questions? And are they surfacing or subsiding at any given time? This is information that helps me steer my business, and it's really critical in how we operate. We also use it as self-service containment, and I've mentioned this a few times now, is that our goal is to try to have as much happening online as possible so that we can have the agents focus on the value-added conversations that, frankly, a machine cannot do well yet. And so getting all the easy transactional stuff off the table really helps do that. Because the more agents you add, the more cost you add. And so what do you do? Take the easy stuff out, keep the same amount of agents, and do more valuable work. When you think about self-service, one of the common things we get is, how do I move? And so that's one of the first things. And there's a whole section on move in, move out, because that's actually, for us, the largest agent volume we get. It's also a really simple transaction. All we need to know is what, who you are, where you're going, when, and a couple of other pieces of information. That does not necessitate a phone call. So when you type in, or click on how do I move, how do I move my service, or any of those things. It brings you to a page that says you have to get your MyHydro profile set up if you don't have one already. Here's how that looks, here's where you go, click here, move my service, fill out a few fields, and you're done. So it explains to customers exactly what they need to do, and it helps be that front door to get them there. That produces containment. And the containment is important because that's what drives down your costs, but also drives up satisfaction. Because the customers that started online and stayed online are happier than those that started online, got your phone number, sat on hold, talked to someone, gave them some information they could have probably typed in in five seconds anyway, and spent a lot of time doing it. The other thing is about our solution that's interesting is it's a communications vehicle that's different from your traditional web page. Not everything deserves a web page, right? Not everything you want to be necessarily Google searchable. 
And when it's subjects that are a bit contentious, like for example, Site C is a project that BC Hydro is building. It's a new dam up in the north of our province. When someone types in Site C as a search or wants to know about it, what they're going to get is some of the messages that we'd lead out there in any press release or any content we'd put out. So we'd say Site C is you know, a hydroelectric project. It's going to power the equivalent of 450,000 homes. It's going to cost $8.3 billion. And here's what it looks like. We're also going to give links to where there's lots of information about it. Those links are actually not on bsider.com. We have a separate site just for Site C because it's that kind of scale of a project. But it'll help you get there. We don't need to put a page on bcider.com that says Site C and just regurgitate this information. We can just allow our virtual assistant to help move that content forward. And then, of course, federated with Site Search in below. And last but not least, and this is a very, I call it pedestrian way to use a solution of this scale, but it's really that Q&A. And what we've done also is through our site, we used to have Q&As peppered everywhere, which was like, oh, question about this program, here's the answer. Question about this, here's the answer. We've collapsed all of that stuff, and we actually just use a, our virtual assistant and teleresponse to do that. And so even if you just take that pedestrian use case and knock all your Q&As out there and put better quality on through a solution like this, people get paired with the answers they needed that much faster. And being able to dynamically curate which questions you want up top was the important ones. Because what we were saying is, well, what do our customers want to know about is one question. And then it's OK, maybe make those the top three. But here are the things we want our customers to know. We're going to make that the bottom three. And so there's six Q&As, half of what we want them to know, half of what they want to know. The combination of the two becomes a very effective solution. And being able to do that dynamically in near real time is what something like this allows you to do. So what? So what was a million questions answered since we've deployed this over a year ago? helped grow our online customer experience. We have more customer, uh, more meaningful customer insights coming in than we've ever had before, which helped shape our content strategy. It has a 92% accuracy rate, so our customers are actually finding it really viable, and they're getting the questions they need answered. And that's growing, because as we keep iterating it over time through that reporting, it goes up a little bit all the time. It's reduced inbound calls to our call center, and it's contributed significant cost savings. When I say significant, I mean tens of millions of dollars in operational cost reductions as an organization over the last five years. And for an organization that you know, cares a lot about service, that's offering it and all doing it in a voluntary way, you have to have solutions that work really well to get that voluntary adoption. If I took my phone number away and I put a charge to talk to someone, then yeah, I could probably get adoption pretty quick, but I'm getting it in kind of a grumbly kind of way. But if you want to do it the right way, you just have to have solutions that work and that are seamless. And our intelligent assistance is just part of our overall automation strategy. So it's everything from transactional self-service to virtual intelligent assistance, to strong content, to better navigation, to all of it. Trying to make it easy to do business with us online, or via mobile, or via social, or on the phone, or in an IVR. And so it really does play a significant role in kind of our overall value proposition, which is the industry that many of you here represent know that the work you're doing does drive real life meaningful improvements. Absolutely, but it has to work. Some help, helpful hints that at least we had along the way. Number one is uh, we made the decision not to pass off our virtual assistants as a person. So we didn't want to put a name on it. We didn't want to brand it. We don't call it Siri or anything like that. Because just from our own customer base, we found that as soon as you do that and you put a name to it, people are expecting human quality interaction. And I have not seen any solution yet that truly does that perfectly. And so as a result, and when I said earlier, it's got to work perfectly if I'm going to say it that way, we decided to not. And what we said was, we're just going to have it as this search, this ask a question, et cetera. And then the expectation is never built up as high, but the delivery is really good. And so we're actually exceeding expectations every time customers use it versus potentially them expecting that human connection and not getting it. So for us, that was an important one. Second one is, is you know, cool technology is really neat and all, but like, I've said this a number of times, it just has to work. And it has to work perfectly. Because if you're going to take something that's fascinating and neat and you're going to expose it to your customers, for that 1% that does it wrong, you're going to hear about it and they're going to tell people about it. And they're going to churn. And so this is where you got to make sure these things are buttoned down and they work perfectly before you make them production ready. Content is more important than technology. Sorry for those in here that are really technology focused people. Um, but the content it portrays is where the tire hits the pavement. And you can have the coolest technology, but if it's giving bad content, it's going to fall over on you. And so making sure to know what, is, what are you saying, how are you saying it, and how does that combination of 
tech and content and that human experience all create a customer experience that is actually viable and what meets their customer's expectations. Another one is listen to your canary in the coal mine. So don't set and forget. Nice way of saying, by any of these tools that many of you use, you're gonna start getting mountains of valuable information coming back. And use that information to continuously improve your solution and make it better for your customers. I've seen a lot of people will go out there and set up something like this and be like, okay, well that's now gonna handle this. And they get sort of usage data coming back and they're not necessarily taking it all in. You really need to, because that's where actually the true value starts to get uncovered. And don't reinvent the wheel. Find the right partners to help. And when you think about even this conference, you know, when you look at Opus Research assembling all of us to talk about this, when you look at sort of the vendor landscape that's in the room, uh, there's a lot of very smart companies that are helping deploy solutions like this. And as I mentioned, the one we do use is IntelliResponse by 24-7, and they've actually done a great job of helping us deploy this. Like, it's tilted up in less than two months, and it started delivering value thereafter, and it continues to do that. And so, if I tried to reinvent the wheel and build a solution like this internally, which we have done, because as a utility, we have large access to things like capital, and we could build solutions if we want to. It would have taken us forever, it would have cost a fortune, and it would not have anywhere close to the efficacy that what a solution or the economies of scale that many of you will bring to market do. And so finding those right partners, getting access to the right information to make the right decisions. So for those of you that are not vendors and that are service providers, think about that before going into any type of solution set. So let me end with a couple of things. What does the future look like? So we talked about that customer journey before, right? That typical thing, something initiates service, they initiate with you, they go through a channel, and they get a solve. Let's now overlay that on something like an outage scenario. This reads pretty simply. Is this a laser? Yeah. Power's on, life's good. Oops, my power goes out. Hey, at least my cell phone still works, is what first people think, people think these days. Let's go to bci.com to get their phone number. Oh, they have a mobile site. That's handy, except the outage isn't listed on it, because it takes a little while for that to happen. In fact, it can take quite some time before that happens. So what do they do? They call, and they sit on hold. They eventually, after sitting on hold for potentially a long period of time, get a hold of a agent who says, oh, the most current information is actually online and we don't know yet, and then hang up, grumble, grumble. That's what it looks like largely today. In the very near future, with all this new automation and new technology and new logic that we're putting in place, is going to look something more like this. Power's on, life's good. Oops, power goes up. At least my cell phone still works. All of a sudden, ding, you have a text message. From BC Hydro, we've detected a power outage in your area. Our crews are working as quickly and safely as they can to find the source of the problem. We'll send you another text as soon as we know. Stand by. Apologize for the inconvenience. They know that I know. Good. A little while later, we found the source of the problem. It was a tree on a line or you know, some animal got fricasseed. And now it's going to take us two to four hours to solve this problem. If we change that in any way, we'll let you know shortly. A little while later, power's on, life's good. The big difference between this scenario and the previous is that the thing that initiated the need for a service call resolved itself in a fully automated loop without the customer having to lift a finger. Think about that for a moment. What kind of technology is required to do it? Well, you have to have sensors on your grid, which then talk to an outage management system, which then go to a customer preference center where customers have given you a mobile device with some kind of opt-in, at which point that creates a trigger, and in so facto, message goes out, life is good. Not that complicated in the modern world. Whereas 10 years ago, that was impossible. That was a dream. But now we can do it. And if you think about virtual assistants, one of the interesting things is that some of the best virtual assistants can be invisible and actually resolve problems before they even come up. So if I now went and grabbed my smartphone, which I love, and I pressed a button, which I do, and asked Siri, for example, when will my power be back on? If any of you, if I asked you that question and you knew enough about me that my phone does, because my phone knows a lot about me, right? Could you answer that question? Probably. Because by saying, when will my power be back on, I say my, it's possessive, so I say mine, so therefore it must be my house or another property I own. My phone knows where I am, so I'm at one place a lot, and it knows where my house is. It also knows that there's only one power company in the whole area, so it must be that one, and we publish that data online. So could it theoretically today, with the right smarts, pull enough together to say, yeah, your power will be back on in an hour? It could. But what happens today is this comes up. And it says, would you like to know about Baltimore Power? How about Storm Center in Ontario? Like, these are thousands of miles away. But that's what comes up when I search it. Because it's a site search looking for the words that I've said and not understanding the context and the cognition of what I'm saying. And that's where virtual assistants really can start bridging that gap between historically a site search and something that's intelligent. 
that understands context, that understands me. And when you think about how great it would be to say something like um, the speaker was saying yesterday, if I just said, pay my electricity bill, if I just said simply those words, and if I said that to you know, my wife or my friends, or et cetera, they would understand enough what that means. They could probably do that without that much work. Whereas again, if I said that to Siri today, it would be Google how to pay your electricity bill. So quite different when it comes to man versus machine. And so that's really kind of the theme I think I wanted to end with here. And so what I need is some poor person from the audience to help with an example really quickly. Can I get a volunteer that doesn't mind turning a little red sometimes? Are you the volunteer? Yeah. Okay. Here's what I need. On the next slide, I'm going to pop up something. And all I need you to do is read it. It's relatively small, so you may want to move a little closer. And just read it out loud to the audience if you can. Okay. You ready for that? Yes. All right. On the, on the right. Holy smokes. I couldn't believe that I could actually understand what I was reading. And I could probably stop here, but people <laughs> wish I could. <laughs> um, but yeah, you transposed a lot of letters and things. Yeah, and I mean, keep reading one or two more sentences. Okay, the phenomenal, or whatever that says, power of the human mind, according to research at Cambridge University, doesn't matter what order the letters in a word are, the only important thing is that the first and last letter be in the right place. Perfect. Live and learn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you, and I appreciate that. So in a matter of moments, with this gobbledygook, he was able to come up and just kind of throw it out there and talk to it in a almost flawless way, instantly. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. So, man versus machine, you want a point for man. Thank you for that. So when I turn to my friend Google, which by the way has ended more pub debates in history than any genius ever has. Because how often do you like, oh I wonder about that, someone's like, oh yeah? <laughs> oh, the answer is five or whatever, right? And I ask Google, I wonder if Google can make sense of this, will they autocorrect it? What I got was this. Your search did not show any matches. So even something that anyone in this room can do in seconds, some of the smartest search technology in the world will still struggle with. And so is that means Google don't use it, it's not something that's actually helpful? No, not at all. But it shows you that the gap between the smartest machines that are out there and the people and how they'll immediately be able to process information still exists to a degree. And so in man versus machine, so far comfortably, you know, man's still winning until, of course, like the Terminator scenario happens, at which point we're toast. But the one last passage I wanted to leave you with before we open up any questions here is that what I view as the future of sort of the intelligent assistance uh, industry is what some of the themes that have been coming up here already. So one is that assistants will start talking to each other. They'll start forming these cognitive connections around systems and tools across industries, across sectors, across companies, and make it easy for customers just to simply live their lives in an ambient and invisible way. And then all of a sudden when they start doing this, all of these connection points that didn't start to make sense initially all start to form together into something that actually does make sense. Like so, I wanted to say thank you so much for your time and attention. Do we have time for some questions? Yeah, we're going to slip the schedule a little bit, but we, yeah, we definitely want to get a couple questions in here. Excellent. This, this isn't a, an intelligent assistant question, it's more of a procedural one. Uh, do you give back or can you make available to your customers the data you collect about their power use so they can put it together with other data? Absolutely, and so when you look at our power use data, um, it's now gone in a modern world to essentially five minute increments. So I can tell you how much power you used every five minutes of every day, and I can tell you that one day behind. So every night I get that information about the previous day. We expose that through our portal for customers on like nice graphs that help work with it, but we also expose it as a data outport, and so they can actually hit download, or in some cases the new one we're just about to launch will offer a real time uh, feed to third party applications. So people that want to use consumption data who authorize it themselves to be used in that way can then use it in all sorts of practical applications around energy management. So, good question. One last question. Greg, you mentioned in the um, implementation a 92% recognition rate. What was the percent call reduction rate? What was the percent? Call reduction to the ah, call center? So, it was ramping over time, and right now we have about 80% uh, of all of our transactions occurring online. And when you think about um, that for us, that's about, I would say about 1.6 million online transactions for about every 400,000 in the field. 
This intelligent assistance piece deflected about an incremental 5 to 10% overnight. Uh, because people that were coming in, hitting the contact us page and flowing through to a phone number and going through, is where we were finding a lot of um, deflection from web into the call center. As soon as we tilted that up, we saw that the use rate of the solution went up immediately. The calls went down immediately. And then as we kept adding more self-service tools into the mix to make it more robust, that trend just continued. And so it was, um, it was overnight in many cases. And, but again, that was subtle how we deployed it because it wasn't something that we were saying, here's an, a virtual assistant for you to work with. We just sort of integrated into how we do contact us, which is not the best possible deployment by any means, but it was the one for us that felt right for our customers. But great question.